So let's look at Romans 10. I want to read verses 13 through 21 just to review for a minute. Romans 10, beginning in verse 13. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen to that. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they, how will they believe in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent, just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Look at your neighbor and say, that's us. Should be each one of us. Verse 16. However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed, they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. Speaking of the Gentiles. And Isaiah is very bold and he says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. Once again, Gentiles. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. My goodness. So Romans 11, we're going to continue to answer an obvious question. That's this. How can believers have assurance concerning their salvation if the Jews have not responded to God's gospel? Will God reject us as well? That's kind of the question that he's going to present here in this chapter. So Paul makes it clear that God has not rejected Israel. We saw that last week. Nor will God reject Gentile believers. If you've come to Christ, you are God's kid and he's your daddy and that's never going to change. This is one of Paul's themes in Romans 11. God does not forsake his people. Everybody say his elect. Those are the ones that God has chosen. He will be our Abba Father forever. So let's look at Romans 10. Let's read verses 19 through 21. Then we'll look at our text. Romans 10, 19. He says, But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? First Moses said, I'll make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. Speaking of God has now turned to the Gentiles. Verse 21. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Now just keep reading. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? Speaking of Israel. May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, Paul says, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? God responds, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, then, there has also come to be, at the present time, a remnant, speaking of Jewish believers, according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained, but those who were chosen, everybody say chosen, they obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, <clears throat> down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? Look at this now. May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous, to make the Jews jealous. Now if, their, if their world, now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen, the Jew, and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, since God has turned and brought Gentiles in, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? He's talking about that. That's going to be the end of time when the Lord is going to return and everything's going to come back to life. That's so, that, so that's our text. So our two memory verses, one is in John 10. Look at these th four verses. 
John 10, 27, read it with me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them. And they will never perish. Here's the other memory verse, Philippians 1, 6. Read it with me. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who had began a good work in you. How many believe that's true? You think God's going to finish what he started in you and me? I'm pretty confident he's going to finish the work in you, and I'm pretty confident he's going to finish the work in me because the Scripture gives us that promise. So look on your notes now. Look at our main idea. God has purposed to save all of his elect, those whose names were written in the book of life from before the foundation of the world. That's in Revelation 13. We must rest in his promises because God will surely finish what he has started. Psalm 138, I quote that all the time. God will perfect that which concerns me. His mercy endures forever. He does not forsake the work of his hands. And he does not. So God's elect are both Jew and Gentile. Everybody say amen to that. Even though the Jews are still pretty much outside, God is not through. So look at Romans 11, verse 1. He says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now look back on your notes. Romans 11 gives us the future of the Jews. Remember, Israel was set apart by God as seen in God's call of Abraham. Abraham was an idol worshiper and he was set apart to the Lord. So, let's, let's, so put your ribbon there in Romans and let's go back to Genesis 12 and let's read where God calls Abram. Genesis 12. Abram, an idol worshiper and a pagan. Genesis 12. Verse 1, now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. He's already old and childless. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. How many families? All the families. Verse 4. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Morah, now the Canaanite was then in the land, and the Lord, appeared, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. If you see anything in all those verses, see this. God started it, God continued it, and God finished it. Everybody say, God will finish what he started. And that's exactly what we see in Abram. So, you know, uh, uh, the, the, verse, the verse 1 of chapter 11 says, may it never be. God has not rejected his people, has he? And Paul's answer is, may it never be. Paul is a Jew, and he's arguing that God has not rejected his people, which includes the Jew. God not, did not reject Saul, who became the apostle Paul, nor has he rejected us, Gentile believers. So go back to our text and look at verses 1 and 2. Romans 11, 1 and 2. I say then God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Now verse 2. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Now we're going to pick that up in just a minute, but now look at verse 2 on your notes. If you are a believer, you are secure in God's hands. John 10, 27 through 30. Look at what Jesus said about this, about us being his sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father. I mean, if, how can they get us out? They can't get us out of Jesus' hand, obviously. He's God the Son. They can't get us out of God the Father. He's God the Father. But we're in both the Father and the Son's. I tell you what, it couldn't be more secure than that. Everybody say amen. All I can say is I love being one of Jesus' sheep. Keep reading on your notes. God did not reject Paul, a Jew, 
nor has God rejected his people whom he foreknew from before the foundation of the world. Verse 2. This includes both Jew and Gentile. Now keep reading. But circumcision, speaking of the Jew, saves no one. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, you must be circumcised in heart. And only God can do that. And what that refers to is the new birth when you're born again. So go back and look at verses 2 through 4 now. Romans 11, verse 2. It says, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars. And I alone am left and they are seeking my life. He was just desperate here. But what is the divine response to him? God says, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now, Elijah obviously didn't know that, but God was informing him. So look on your notes now. Verses 2 through 4, Jewish apostasy. Okay, Paul is quoting Elijah's complaint in verse 3. So here's the definition of an apostate. That's someone who professed faith in Christ, or in this case, professed faith in Yahweh before Jesus came, and yet they were not born again, they were not genuine, and later they repudiated and denied the faith they once professed. Now we see this really prevalent in the Christian church as a whole. For example, a lot of people you know, have turned their back on the gospel you know, and the scripture, and true believers. You know, in other words, look on your notes there. A definition is of an apostate, someone who professed faith, was not born again and later repudiated or denied the faith they once possessed. When a church turns its back on the gospel and on the scripture, that is apostate. And if you know a church that has done that, you need to turn your back and get out of that church because that's not where Christians should be. Everybody say amen. God said to Elijah, though, when, God was, when he was complaining about this, he said, I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Elijah thought he was the only one. So look on your notes now. Thank God we stand in his grace. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. We need it. The perseverance of the saints is only because God perseveres with each one of his people. And I was reading this week about Samson. You know, Samson was deceived and, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? By Delilah. You know, and she keeps pushing him to get, you know, the secret to his strength. You know the story, you know, and of course they're, they're, sexually active, which is not good. But finally, he relents and tells her it's about his hair. So she cuts his hair off. So what happens? He gets captured by the enemy. They're going to kill him. But guess what? His hair grew back. What does that tell us? God is in charge. And God's grace is greater than our failures. So look on your notes now. When someone who professes to be a believer denies the truth of Scripture, he is an apostate. But John 10, 26 through 30, keep your ribbon in Romans. Go over to John 10. I want to read these five verses. John 10, 26. This is where the Jews were questioning things about Jesus. If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. So verse 26, Jesus said this. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Hmm. What is that? What would we call that doctrine? Not sheep gate. We'd call that election. That's our exactly right. Verse 27. <laughs> my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And I wrote on your notes here. We hear the voice of our shepherd, and he knows us. We're in his hands and in the Father's hand, we couldn't be more secure. Now go back to Romans 11 and look at verse 5. Romans 11, 5. It says, in the same way then, well, back up at verse 4. Well, verse 3. Elijah. Lord, they've killed your prophets, they've torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. What's the divine response to him? God says, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now verse 5. In the same way then... There has also come to be at the present time a remnant. Everybody say a remnant. It's talking about believers here. According to God's gracious choice. But if, if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, speaking of the Jewish mentality. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Now look on your notes. Romans 11, 5 through 6. A remnant by grace. 
Seed left after the field has been sown. The stump left after a tree has been cut down. Both of those are metaphors in the scripture referring to the people of God. You and I as Christians are reserved for God from before birth by his decree of election and we're redeemed by our Lord Jesus through his life and sacrifice. How many, aren't you glad that he's right now at the right hand of the Father, risen and interceding for you and me? My goodness, and on your notes, I wrote that down. Jesus now intercedes for us at the Father's right hand. That's the place of power and the place of favor. You and I, Christian, have been bought with his blood, and that is eternal. Here's Psalm 62. Look at these four verses. My soul wait in silence for God only, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. On God my salvation and my glory rest. Amen to that. The rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Trust in Him. Even during COVID? Boy, for sure. During Our, our country's gone nuts. Trust in Him at all times. O people, pour out your heart before Him. Read it with me. God is a refuge for us, Selah. Now, your ribbon is in Romans. Go back to John and go to the 17th chapter now. I'm going to look briefly at Jesus' prayer here, John 17. Beginning in verse 6. This is Jesus' high priestly prayer. He prays, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. <laughs> Don't you love the way Jesus prays for us and sees us knowing what he's going to do in us? Verse 7, now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me I have given to them and they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. What we're seeing here is what God knows and what Jesus knows he's going to do in these people, even though this has not yet completely happened yet in their lives. Verse 9, I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world. The cross was just right in view here, folks. And yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. Hmm, that would be a good thing for you and I to pursue. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, Judas obviously, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that, they may have my, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. That's true of you and I. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not in the world. Read verse 17 out loud. sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. Here's John 17, Jesus' prayer. And then Judas betrays Jesus in the next chapter, chapter 18, and all the disciples freak out and run away from fear. Now, how many, Jesus knew that was going to happen, did he not? So he prayed for them before all that took place. That's simply the way Jesus is. He is eternal and he is God Almighty. So the remnant that he has chosen is according to God's gracious choice. Look again in our text, Romans 11, 5 and 6, one more time. In the same way, God kept 7,000 in, in, in that day where they didn't bow their knee to Baal. In the same way, there has also come to be at the present a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Now keep reading. Look at verse 7, Romans eleven seven. 7. What then? What Israel is seeking, it has, it has not obtained but those who were chosen obtained it. In other words, the Jews haven't come in like you, like you would think they did, but yet those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened just as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. Mm, mm. Look on your notes where it says spiritual blindness. 
These Israelites were blind, here it is, because God made them blind, which was punishment for their sin. They did not want to see the things of God and God abandoned them to their sinful desires. We see this all the way back in Moses in Deuteronomy 29. Look at these, look at these verses, Moses. Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, you have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh. I mean, all those signs and wonders, including, you know, dividing the river as they cried, my goodness, and all all his servants and all his land, how the great trials which your eyes have seen, these great signs and wonders. Yet to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandal has not worn out on your... And yet they still had not come to be able to trust in God. A heart to know, eyes to see, ears to hear. Listen, all that comes to us from God. It doesn't come from our own disciplines. Look at the next paragraph on your notes. Paul quotes Isaiah in verse 8. Let me read it for you. Verse 8. He says, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, and ears to hear not, down to this very day. Now look back over on your notes. If you do not want to hear God's word, as the Jews didn't want to in this day, God can make you unable to hear his word. That's it basically a principle of judgment. The same principle applies to seeing the kingdom of God, hearing and seeing. This is God's judgment for hearing and not believing. So what does Paul do next? Look at verses 9 and 10. Now he's going to, going to quote David. Look at verse 9. And David says about the Jews, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. Now look on your notes. It's pretty crazy, is it not? God's blessings are to be appreciated and we are to be thankful. Amen. If we shut our eyes and ears to God's word, our hearts will become hardened. To continue like this will lead to judgment. Our love for God must include reverence and respect. Everybody say amen to that. I've got a very difficult passage I want to read to us in Malachi chapter 1. Look at, these, look at these verses beginning in verse 6. God is speaking here. He says, A son honors his father and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? God asking this of his people. And if I am a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? Here's the answer. You are presenting defiled food upon my altar, but you say, how have we defiled you? In that you say the table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you present the blind for sacrifice, they bring in animals that were not worthy of sacrifice. Is it not evil? When you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? <laughs> Would he be pleased with you? Or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord? Of, the Lord is really rebuking them strongly here. Look at the next verse. But now will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us? With such an offering on your part, will he receive any of you kindly? Says, in other words, in all of all that they've done, and go to the next verse. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates so that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my... In other words, God is saying, I'm sick of you making sacrifices and offering of animals that are not perfect. I'm, he says, I wish somebody would lock the door. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. I wrote on my notes next to that scripture. Wow. Look on your notes now. Keep reading. Many of the Jews miss salvation in spite of Israel being God's chosen people, this was because of their rejection of Christ. And as a result of that, the blessings that God had given them as Jews really kind of became a curse. Keep reading on your notes. We see this same principle in the visible church in America. I'm talking about the church in name only. Okay, hardened hearts. Here's two examples on your notes. Water baptism is an outward sign of faith in Christ Jesus. What does, is that how the hypocrite sees water baptism? No, they think that if they get dunked in the baptism that they're saved. Does water baptism save anybody? No. no. Should anybody who's not saved be water baptized? Should anybody who is saved be baptized? Yes, it's following after what the Lord has instructed, but salvation has nothing to do with getting baptized. And here's the second one, communion. 
Partaking of the communion elements saves. This, what this is, is religious hypocrisy. I would like to say religious idiocy. In other words, communion, the sacrament, is for God's children, for those who are born again. As Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And here's one more I've got on your notes. Worship. Scripture instructs us to come together for worship, not entertainment. That doesn't mean we shouldn't strive to do worship skillfully and do it well musically, but we don't come to church to be entertained. Keep reading. We are there to have fellowship with the saints. <laughs> I'm going to say something I probably shouldn't say, but I'm going to say it. No, I'm not going to say it. Why are some people so eager to be the first ones out of the parking lot? Why are some people so eager to be the first ones out of the parking lot? We're here to have fellowship, with, not to be the first ones out the door. And I, I mean, I know some of us have that. That's probably the way that we are mentally. You know, we want to be. You know what? We need to relax while we're in church. I'm speaking to myself as well. And you know, when church is over, you should take five, ten minutes to talk to somebody. See somebody you don't know. Introduce yourself. See somebody run out the door. Tackle them and talk to them. <laughs> Sorry, look on your notes. Don't you dare tackle them, by the way. <laughs> we are there to have fellowship with the saints, to hear God's word, and to worship, everybody say, together. Yeah. We're supposed to be a family, folks. All this is meant to strengthen us in our walk with the Lord. Now, here's Romans 11:9. 9. Look at this. Luther comments on this verse. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Look on your notes now. Luther comments on that verse, quoting Psalm 69, 22. This is what Luther said. It's like a flower whose nectar is used by the bee to make honey, but it is poisonous to the spider. In other words, it doesn't benefit anybody. Hmm. To those being saved, I'm talking about genuine salvation now, the scripture is God's word. It's sweeter than honey. We should have a heart that desires to be in the word of God. To those who are perishing, listen, scripture really has no appeal. It may have an intellectual appeal, but it doesn't have a heart appeal because you've got to be born again to see the light of God's word. Everybody say amen. And so Israel's attempt at legalism did not please God. So now let's keep reading. Look at Romans 11 and look at verse 11. 11, 11. Paul says this. I say then, they, the Jew, did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them, the Jew, jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? He says, but I am speaking to you who are Gentiles inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy, my fellow countrymen, speaking of the Jews, and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, speaking of the Gentiles, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also, and if the root is holy, the branches are too. We'll get to that next week. But look on your notes now where it says salvation for the Gentiles. Paul asks a rhetorical question. They, speaking of Israel, did not stumble so as to fall, did they? And he answers his own question. He says, may it never be. It's in verse 11. Israel missed her calling and has become blind to the truth of the gospel. And in a general sense, from what I can see, Israel is still blind to the truth of the gospel. They tripped over Messiah, as the scripture says. He was a rock of offense and a stumbling stone. That's in 1 Peter 2. Look at these four verses. And coming to him, to Christ, as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, believer, as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture, God speaking, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, that's Jesus, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Amen. Look at the next two verses. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, 
and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And this is amazing here. And to this doom, they were also appointed. What does that mean? It means they were not elect from the beginning. Keep reading on your notes. This is a mystery on your notes. Now Paul in Romans 11, 11 through 15, tells us that God had a purpose in Israel's stumbling. God calls this a mystery in Romans eleven twenty five. 25. Go all the way forward to the 25th verse of the 11th chapter. We're almost done here. We'll pick this up again next week, but I want to look at this in advance. Romans eleven twenty five. 25. He says, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, speaking of the Jews still, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. All Israel refers to all of the elect in Israel. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sin. It, God is not finished yet with Israel. Everybody say amen. amen. So look on your notes. The word mystery in the New Testament refers to something that was hidden and now is being revealed and made plain to God's people. Now here's Colossians 1. Look at these five verses. Paul writes, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Everybody say, thank you, Lord. That's our salvation. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Then Paul says this, for this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Now leave that verse up there right now. I want us to read that last verse again. And I want to, when you see the word I, I want you to make that you, okay? In other words, I want, when I say, when I read that, we're going to say I, I'm going to think of me. So let's read it again. Read, read, read the last verse out loud. Here we go. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power. Is that true or false? Does his power work through you? Absolutely. So read it one more time like we just did. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power. God is able to use you in ways you've never dreamed as you begin to be obedient when you see the opportunities presented. It's the truth. On your notes, now we're almost done. This grand mystery that was veiled in the Old Testament is now made clear Gentiles are now included in the people of God. That's probably every one of us in this room are Gentiles. It was obviously veiled in the Old Testament, but it wasn't completely hidden. In other words, God's covenant with Abraham had the promise that Abraham would be blessed, listen now, and that he would be a blessing to all the nations of the world. So there, the Gentiles were even in that somewhat. Now, every true believer, both Jew and Gentile, is born again as a child of God. So that ethnicity is really not an issue. Look back on your notes in the next paragraph now. One of God's designs in the mystery of Israel's stumbling and the conversion of the Gentiles is to provoke the Jews to jealousy. God has worked through the disobedience of the Jews to bring the Gentiles into his covenant. So I want to read again chapter 11, verse 12. One more time. It says, Now if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles as wonderful as that is for us as Gentiles being saved, how much more will their fulfillment be? <laughs> Riches for the Gentiles. In other words, God's purposes for the Jew are not finished. They're still at work, and he is going to finish what he started in everyone, including his people, the Jews. Everybody say amen. So on your notes, in all this, God's sovereignty is clearly seen. When I think about God's patience and God's love, and God's perseverance. I mean, now we're talking about it in the context of the Jew, but I think about it in the context of me. And you know what? God was patient with me. God persevered with me. God brought me out of stumbling, backsliding, drugs, all kinds of things. You know what? God 
saves sinners. Paul said he was the chief of sinners. And when I see him, I'd like to argue with him a little bit, even though I know he was worse than I am. But aren't you glad that he saved you? You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. You didn't even fully understand it when you came in. It's all of grace. What a wonderful father we have. My goodness, I got carried away. Look at the conclusion, we're done. Paul points out an amazing promise. If God brings good out of Israel's failure, how much more good will come out of Israel's restoration? That day is coming. And by the way, we have several verses of Scripture in the, in, in the Bible that tell us to pray for the conversion of Israel. We should be praying that. Romans eleven twelve 12 says this about Israel. How much more will their fulfillment be? So my last thought is personal application for you and I. Here it is. God is in charge of world events and he is working his eternal plan. We can rejoice and rest in him. Read it out loud. He will bring us. So what I'm trying to say is Jesus is our savior. He's the only savior and you and I are gonna trust in him. Amen. So let's finish, let's finish our text. Look at verses 33 through 36, 11, 33. We'll be back to this next week, but just read it for me. Read it with me, 11, 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor or who was first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? Read verse 36 with me. For from him and through him and to him, to him, amen.